a personal pocket computer wizard so small you can take it with you anywhere. That sure sounds familiar, but in fact, I am quoting from an ad published in a newspaper in Midland, Texas in 1975. It was advertising the Sharp number 1802 calculator, which boasted, in its advanced technology, it boasted the broad mathematical abilities of a slide rule. Well, we've come a long way since then to the point where probably a lot of us don't even know what a slide rule is. But are we smarter now because technology has come so far and put a lot more than a slide rule into our pockets? Or are we so dependent on this wizard that is technology to do things for us that we are losing the ability to make our own magic, mentally, socially, politically? Well, that sounds like the makings of a debate. So let's have it. Yes or no to this statement. Smart technology is making us dumb. A debate from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan. We are at the Kaufman Music Center in New York City. We have four superbly qualified debaters, two against two, who will be arguing for and against the motion, smart technology is making us dumb. Dumb. As always, our debate goes in three rounds, and then our live audience here in New York votes to choose the winner, and only one side wins. Let's meet our debaters, the team arguing for the motion. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Nicholas Carr. And Nick Carr, you are the author of The Glass Cage, Automation and Us, as well as The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. That was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Um, in these books, uh, Nick, you are warning readers about the danger of our growing reliance on computers. So I am wondering, do you possess a smartphone? Well, I resisted for a long time, but about six months ago, I finally, finally broke down and, and bought my first smartphone. And, and how is that relationship working out? We're, we're still, still feeling each other out. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Carr. And Nick, who is your partner? My partner is the acclaimed writer and thinker, Andrew Keen. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Keen, please welcome him. Andrew, you are also arguing for the motion that smart technology is making us dumb. You are an entrepreneur, you're executive director of uh, Futurecast Salon, you're host of the web series Keen On, and you've also written a lot of books, including The Internet is Not the Answer. However, your critics have chosen some, some lively language to describe you. They have described you as a mastodon growling against the warm wind of change. <laughs> and your Wikipedia entry once briefly read, Andrew Keene is an expletive expletive. <laughs> so what do you do to deserve all this hostility? Uh, I told the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing we're going to hear some of that tonight. Yes. But we won't be hearing expletives from the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, the team arguing for the motion, smart technology is making us dumb. And we have a team arguing against the motion. First, please welcome Genevieve Bell. <laughs> Genevieve Bell, very, very interesting story. You're vice president, Intel fellow, and you work in Intel's corporate strategy office where your job basically is to worry about the future. Before all of this, however, you were teaching in the anthropology department at Stanford. So our question is for all of the humanities and social science majors out there, how does a, 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 a cultural anthropologist end up working at Intel? Ooh, like all good Australians, I met a man in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Details to come later, thank you. <laughs> and Genevieve, who is your partner? My partner is the lovely, talented, and charming David Weinberger. Ladies and gentlemen, David Weinberger. David Weinberger, you're also arguing against the motion that smart technology is making us dumb. You're a senior researcher at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. You're at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard at the Kennedy School. Uh, you've written a bunch of books also, including Too Big to Know and The Clue Train Manifesto. You wrote that back in 1999, which was an early book looking at the Internet's effect on business. And you came up with 95 theses. So have they stood up to the test of time? Uh, yeah, uh, pretty well. The most important point that we made, because it was co-authored, was that um, the web is actually a social place, although it didn't look like it at the time. Um, one of the things we got very wrong was that we didn't know we would have to fight to keep the web the way it was. So you were, were, you were only a partial visionary. I, I am a uh, very uh, shaded 
if not shady. <laughs> I'm going to get you out of that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Steinberger and thank him. And these are our teams arguing for and against the motion, smart technology is making us dumb. On to round one. Round one are opening statements by each debater in turn. And here to make his opening statement in support of the motion, please welcome to the lectern Nick Carr. He is author of The Glass Cage, Automation and Us, and The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Carr. Thank you, and thank you, John. Uh, we're gathered here tonight to talk about our intelligence uh, and about whether our smartphones and our apps and our social media accounts are expanding it or eroding it. Are we more thoughtful now, thanks to our technologies, or less thoughtful? How is the technology influencing the way our minds work? By now, I think all of us, if we're honest, uh, know pretty well how we use our gadgets. We use them compulsively. And the research bears this out. The average person with a smartphone will pull out the phone and look at it about 150 times a day. And that breaks down to about six minutes for your every waking hour. And when you start to add up all the messages, all the notifications, all the alerts, all the pins, all the Instagrams, uh, all the Google searches and everything else, what you get is a clear picture that we have created uh, an environment of constant distraction. But what does it actually do to our brains and how our brains operate? To answer that question, I think we have to look at how we transform information, which is just the raw material of thinking, into actual knowledge. And that process hinges on the transfer of that information between two forms of memory. On the one hand, you have your working memory, which is essentially the contents of your consciousness at any given moment. And we know, what we know about working memory is it has an extremely small capacity. You can only hold about two to four pieces of information in your mind, your conscious mind, simultaneously. And then on the other side, you have our long-term memory, what we usually refer to as memory. The key to building knowledge, the key to deep intelligence, is being able to move incoming information from your conscious mind over into your long-term memory. The problem today is that we're constantly overloading that small store of our working memory. And this creates a phenomenon, an uh, actual biological phenomenon, called cognitive overload. Now, we are right to celebrate all the great things we get from smart technologies, from the internet, but what we too often forget is that information is not knowledge, it's not intelligence, and it's certainly not wisdom. Um, and when we spend all of our time gathering information, what gets crowded out is the time to distance yourself from distractions and interruptions and think deeply about things. I think we have to be honest with ourselves, and I would suggest you look not only to the science, not only to what everybody on the stage is going to say, but to your own experience with the technology, how you use it. Uh, whether when you want to think deeply, you pull out your smartphone or you try to distance yourself from your smartphone and from your computers. And I think if you're honest with yourself, uh, you'll conclude that indeed our smart technologies are making us dumb and you'll vote for that proposition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas Carr. And that is the motion, smart technology is making us dumb. And here to argue against the motion, uh, David Weinberger, author of Too Big to Know, Rethinking Knowledge Now That the Facts Aren't the Facts, Experts Are Everywhere, and the Smartest Person in the Room is the Room. Ladies and gentlemen, David Weinberger. Thank you. Uh, so if Nick is right, and our technology is having this physical effect on our physical brain, make, keeping us from being able to for, form knowledge out of information, then why is this, it seems to me and to Geneve, that this is, this is the greatest time in human history to be somebody who cares about knowledge. This is, this is a, a renaissance of knowledge. If, if we take the question, um, is our smart tech making us dumb, um, I, I want to not even refute that. I, I want to ask, why do we keep asking that? Because if smart means understanding more, we now have from, from the Higgs boson to the Hubble 
telescope, we have the ability through our smart technology to understand more about a universe that's 14 billion years old. And, and if smart means better at our work, then I absolutely, and you absolutely, want your doctor, your auto mechanic, and your airplane pilot to have the smartest technology that there is. So why do we ask? I think in part it's because of the shock of the new. And this is very, very new, what's going on. Um, Andy Clark is a philosopher, and he makes the point that we don't no, we don't think in our heads. We think with things in the world, out in the world. So a mathematician thinks with chalk on a blackboard. An architect thinks with models in her hands or with using a straight edge or something. And a meteorologist who's using our old tech, who just has a weather vane, is not going to be nearly as smart as a meteorologist who is gathering data from sensors around the world, big data put to use to predict the weather down to the hour. That's really, really smart. And it's our smart technology that lets us do that. Another reason why perhaps we entertain this notion um, is that we have a natural tendency to think that the technology we grew up with is natural and is good, but that's not the case. We, we didn't invent gatekeepers because we said, uh, in, in, in the old world, you know, in our prior world, we didn't invent uh, gatekeepers because we thought it was just a swell idea to vastly limit the amount of information and knowledge that we were going to make public. We invented gatekeepers because the old medium, that technology of paper, was so limited. It had gates, and the gates were really, really narrow. And so we needed to have gatekeepers. But now we don't. Now the gates are down. We have this huge abundance, and we adopt new strategies for that. And sometimes it's, it's disconcerting. One of the main strategies is that we skim. We skim a lot. That's actually a really adaptive uh, uh, technique for dealing with it. And it's not even an old technique. It's a technique that we use when we go into an old-fashioned real bookstore, and there are thousands of titles, and we skim them on the shelves really quickly to find what we're interested in. And now, so we still do that now. We're doing it online. And just as then, when we find something that's interesting to us, we start reading it. So it seems clear to me that to argue that our smart tech is making us dumb is not only to be on the wrong side of history, in this case, it's to be on the wrong side of evolution. So I urge you to vote against the proposition and to do so emphatically. Thank, Thank you, David Weinberger. I'm John Donvan. Round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate continues in just a moment. And a reminder of what's going on, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where our motion is smart, technology is making us dumb. You have heard from the first two debaters and now on to the third debating for the motion that smart technology is making us dumb. Let's welcome to the lectern Andrew Keene. He is executive director of the Silicon Valley Salon, Futurecast, and author of the book, The Internet is Not the Answer. Well, I've I've often been accused of being on the wrong side of history, but I love the idea of being on the wrong side of evolution. <laughs> so David is clearly a passionate man, a great deal of respect and love for him. We've jousted many times before, but I've never heard him quite as effusive of our world. He talks about something he calls a renaissance of knowledge. A renaissance of knowledge, David. When was the last time you turned the internet on? It's, it's on right now. When was right the now. last time you looked at Twitter? When was the last time you went on Facebook? When was the last time you observed the nature of our digital culture, the very culture that Nick so brilliantly tore apart in his opening remarks? What Nick is describing is the end of distance. Perhaps if we're academics, we would call it the death of distance. We all become the media in this world. We all have our devices. We all have our publishing platforms. We can all tell the world what we're thinking, what we're doing, where we're going, what we're wearing, unfortunately, sometimes what we're not wearing. It explains our contemporary cult of authenticity, this idea that we always have to be true to ourselves. It's, of course, a manifestation of a particularly corrupted nature of democracy, a world where everything is intimate, everything is personalized. It simply confirms our 
misplaced ideal that the world revolves around us. It's a pre-Copernican notion. And ironically, it's technology <laughs> confirming that. The ultimate consequence, of course, of this is the selfie. This is a selfie culture. <laughs> this is a culture where the ultimate expression is photographing ourselves in front of a masterpiece, in front of Auschwitz, in front of someone jumping off the Bay Bridge. These are true examples of selfie culture. Meanwhile, what's going on? David celebrates the narrow gatekeepers that have been destroyed. But of course, since we have this so-called smart technology, what has happened to those gatekeepers? We're seeing not only the death of distance, but the death of newspapers, the death of recorded music, the death of the professional creative class, the people who made their living thinking, the people who made their living writing books, the people who made their living taking photographs. That kind of professionalism is in crisis. So what we have is this double whammy. On the one hand, personalization, intimacy, driven more and more into ourselves, into an echo chamber culture. And on the other hand, the death of a professional culture. That is why you should believe that smart culture, whoops, smart technology, that was Freudian, smart technology <laughs> is certainly making us dumb. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew Keene. And that is the motion, smart technology is making us dumb. And here's our final debater against the motion in this opening round. Please welcome Genevieve Bell. She's an anthropologist, Intel fellow, and vice president at Intel Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, Genevieve Bell. Smart technology makes us smart and it makes us safer. If you were to look in the last year, I can pull you examples from all over the world. In many African countries and in, on the Indian subcontinent, mobile phones and text messages are used by governments to send out health warnings and preventative health messages. When the Ebola outbreak was taking place, messages were sent on smartphones to tell people how to handle themselves, their communities and the bodies that they were encountering. Hardly dumb, right? In the United States, you have the Amber Alert, something I'm sure many of you hope to never see on your telephones, but when you do, you know what to do. It's about making a community and the kids in it, hopefully, safer and ultimately making all of us smarter about danger. I'm the child of an anthropologist. I grew up with indigenous people in Australia. I spent a lot of time in indigenous communities and it's been fascinating to watch over the last 20 years as those communities have embraced new technologies to do old things. The Naranjuri, with whom my family have worked for the last 20 years, use the internet to tell their stories. They like the fact that newspapers are being archived because they can use the stories in those about their colonial contact and argue about how to regain their land. Moving closer to home at Intel, we're deeply concerned about diversity in the tech community, about diversity in STEM education. And one of our challenges frequently is to convince young women and ethnic minorities that there's room for them inside the sciences. And one of the ways you do that is by telling the stories of people who've been there before. It's nice to be in New York for me. I get to go visit Judy Chicago's dinner table at the Brooklyn Museum and I think about how hard it was for her to reclaim all of those women's names and how much easier it is to do it today. My Twitter feed just recently brought me the name of Sharla Boheme, who actually was the original lead name on pocket sim packet simulation technology. You don't need to know what it is, but it is the foundation of the internet and she was involved until quite recently people didn't know that. So is using smart technology to tell our stories and tell them widely and bring more people into the conversation making us dumb? I certainly hope not because it's something I participate in regularly. And almost last but by no means least, let's tackle the notion of community and citizenship. Andrew brought it up, let's take it on a little bit more seriously. Would fight in Santana think that he was doing something dumb when he took out his camera phone and recorded a policeman shooting someone in South Carolina and we watched that video rocket around America and drive yet a further conversation about race and violence and what it means to be a citizen. We can dismiss hashtag activism, such a great phrase, um, as being a sort of a fleeting thing, right? Whether it's hashtag Black Lives Matter, not all men, so black Australia from my hometown. But truthfully, the use of technology to propel conversations about citizenship is hardly new. A photograph made a huge difference in how we talked about the Vietnam War. The radio and vinyl records, which are making a comeback, I'll have you know, help distribute the word of Martin Luther King, and the suffragettes really liked a good typewriter. So is smart technology in those cases making us dumb? I don't think so. 
<laughs> Let me just reflect briefly on something else. Smart technology is also in our everyday lives, and some of those things we may not think about as making us smart, but they're certainly changing, I would argue, for the better personhood. Here's my last example, online dating. <laughs> when I was in India doing fieldwork many years ago, a place that has been embracing this technology for a long time, a woman said to me, getting a husband is just a database problem. <laughs> so, let us imagine, from changing ideas of citizenship and safety to ideas of romance to ideas of what it means to be in the world, it's really hard, I imagine, for any of you to sit in this room and to agree to the proposition that smart technology is making us dumb. So along with David, I think you should emphatically vote against it. Thank, Thank you, you, Genevieve Bell. And that is our motion, smart technology is making us dumb. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. Now we move on to round two, and round two is where the debaters address one another directly and take questions from me and from you and our live audience here in New York. The motion is this, smart technology is making us dumb. We have heard two debaters argue, argue strenuously for the motion. They have made the argument that the, the new technology, and we all know what we're talking about because it's in our pockets, uh, is creating a new environment of constant distraction and perpetual interruption, which leads to a kind of cognitive overload, which ultimately diminishes attentiveness, and as a result, of uh, the accumulation and use of knowledge uh, suffers. They also make the case that um, smart technology creates a false ideal of, of intimacy, which in itself is actually devoid of communication, and in that sense, harmful to the culture overall. The team arguing against the motion, Genevieve Bell and David Weinberger, argue that thanks to smart technology, we are living in a renaissance of knowledge, that uh, being smart means being able to understand the world better, uh, to be better at our work than ever before. They hail the fact that the gatekeepers of knowledge are on the run and possibly in some cases dead. Um, and they talk about, in general, the expansion of cultural knowledge, particularly in communities who previously didn't have ways to connect or had a voice, and that the technology gives them those voices. Nick Carr, um, David Weinberger said that skimming is good. Um, and he said, we do it naturally. We go into libraries and we skim and we, we, we select very quickly. And so he direct challenge to your, your argument that this, that this distraction that you talked about that the internet represents uh, is so problematic. I, we read in different ways and they're all valuable. One way of reading is skimming. If you, if you open a magazine or newspaper, you do a lot of skimming. But then, particularly when, you're, when you have a book or a news, printed newspaper or something in front of you, you also, when something interests you, you move to a much deeper form of reading where you're not skimming, you're actually reading, you're going line by line. And what research into how people read when they're looking at their phones or their computer shows is that skimming becomes the default, the, the dominant form of reading. And in fact, you, if you look at the research, the, the researchers talk about the F pattern by which they mean that people, when, they, when people read on a computer screen, they go across the first couple of lines of text all the way, and then their eyes drift down the margin a little bit, and then they go about halfway uh, across the text, and then their eyes just drift down the rest of the margin, so it forms this F pattern, and then you click and you go somewhere else. So skimming is fine in context, Better and more important is actually reading deeply. So Genevieve Bell, you, you're approaching this, we know, as an anthropologist. But the description that, that Nicholas gives from the, the sort of lab, the bench science on this, do you find it concerning? Do you, first of all, do you dispute it or, or concede it? And in either case, do you find it concerning? I'm not sure I'm willing to dispute it, but I am willing to suggest that, you know, we're at a very, it, it may not feel like it to many of us in this room, Nick, obviously the exception, having only had a smartphone for six months. Um, this technology is still relatively new. It doesn't always feel that way, but a lot of this technology has been in mainstream adoption in the United States for less than a decade. And I think, you know, one of the things that's very clear is that the first studies that were done about the impact of the internet on our sociality, on our personalities, have long since been eclipsed by some of the other pieces of work, where some of the early assessments we made about how technology would affect people have now been proven when you have more data to be very different. And then I think the second question is, I am also interested in what those studies look like beyond the United States and about what it means to not keep reducing smart technology down to Facebook, Google, Twitter, and a phone, when in fact we know that the technologies that are in people's worlds that are smart are far beyond that. And the impact of those, I think, is m much more complex. Andrew Keane? I'm, um, I'm very suspicious of Ge Genevieve's sort of argument about 
the non-Western world. We always hear this about these new technologies. We always hear, well, this is going to change everything. This is going to empower Aboriginal people. This is going to solve poverty. But look at the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was um, embraced by the digital utopians because it was supposedly throwing off autocracy. But what we've seen after the collapse of the Arab Spring is more anarchy. And what we see with this technology is a failure to actually create coherent political movements because of the death of distance, because of this intimacy and personalization. We saw the same indeed with, um, with, with, with the Occupy movement in, 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 in the United States. It's like a firework. It explodes. And when you look up in the sky, it's wonderful for about 10 seconds. And then it goes away. There's no consequence. There's no depth. I want to sort of get your reaction to that. Does, does Arab Spring represent a failure of the promise, or does the Arab Spring reveal the false promise of smart technology? I'm not sure who made the promises. I'm also not entirely sure what this has to do with being dumb but, uh, or smart. Nevertheless. Well, I think it does in the sense that we're making broader claims about whether cultures are, are, are being raised up. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> I do think there is some disagreement uh, on the panel about what we're, we're talking about in terms of, of culture. I, I'm not sure what promise was made. I don't know who makes promises and, and so forth, but um, the Internet proved itself not only to be a superb tool for organizing, for organizing people without a leader, which is a pretty remarkable thing. This was leaderless organization. It also, and I know this from talking f f uh, with people from Tunisia, um, they credit, at least in part, the Internet with giving them the idea of freedom, the sense that they can have a voice, they should have a voice, they are, it is their right as citizens because they can do it on the net. Why can't they do it in public for their government? And I will use the word, that is empowering. So well, that's... I, I, Nick Hart. You know, I think, Nick you know, Hart. the Internet is a communication platform, and you can communicate good stuff and you can communicate bad stuff. You can communicate... Uh, health care information, as Genevieve said, or you can be ISIS and send out YouTube videos of beheadings as recruitment tool. So I don't think you can, uh, I don't think you can leap to the assumption that even as a basic communication platform, this is something that is naturally or, or inclined to be a good thing that raises people up and lets them think deep thoughts. We're, you know, sending out links to silly videos. We're going, spending huge amounts of time on Facebook. We're sending Snapchats. We have to, in order to answer the question before us, we have to look at how this technology has actually evolved, how people are actually using it now, not some utopian dream of how it can be used, and how that reflects on the depth of the thought that it is inspiring in us. Genevieve Bell, I think it's just been handed to you. There are lots of things that people do with technology in this current moment that may not rise to the bar of tenured faculty and book writers that doesn't necessarily mean it's dumb. Is everyone who's on Facebook dumb? That makes everyone in this room dumb. Is every, I'm willing to bet, and if not you, then your children. <laughs> and while you may say many things about your children, you are not yet willing to imagine they are dumb. Does it mean that every single one of us who uses GPS because we're directionally challenged is an idiot? Does it mean the fact that I like Microsoft to spell check me make me dumb? I don't think so. So there's sort of something in there about what is the judgment lurking beneath dumb? that requires just a little bit of uh, scrutiny. I'm going to audience questions now. Um, sir, right down front here. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Klein. Um, we can talk about the technology, the internet, and the search engines, but what about the devices themselves? I see a whole young generation of my grandchildren and their peers growing up with it and using their thumbs instead of their brains. And, the, and almost it's like a pacifier for young children. And so how can that possibly really uh, produce young adults or teenagers who are smarter? How can it do anything but hold back the, the brain from achieving its full potential? Let me take it to Nick Carr first. Sure. I, I think there... I, I think the, the negative effects influence people of all ages, 80-year-olds as well as 
10-year-olds. But I do think it's particularly dangerous for, for young children whose we know their, their brains are in the process of being formed. Um, and we also know that the best thing you can do for a child is to give them lots of different experiences, playing with clay, doing, you know, interacting with people face to face. And what we're doing often with, a, with even ever younger children is putting more and more of their attention on screens. And we're seeing this in schools, we're seeing it out of schools. And I think uh, it's hard to conclude from what we know about child development that kind of giving this uh, more and more constrained way of interacting with the world is going to produce broader-minded, uh, more curious children. I think it's going to have the opposite effect. Let me take the question to the other side. Are you allowed to applaud? It's... Um, David or Genevieve would like to take that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that run through that, right, is we have a persistent anxiety about the impact of new technologies on our children. This one has a particular kind of uh, visceralness to it, I'm willing to bet. Many of your parents worried about the impact of radio, rock and roll, television on all of us. The jury is in some ways still out on rock and roll, obviously, but not the rest. Um, And there's something about why it is that we worry about technology and children in particular. And I think, you know, there are reasons to suggest, and Nick's right on this, that a diversity of experiences is a good thing. The challenge, however, here is also beyond the kind of notion that every child is born with a smart device in one hand and only a thumb in the other. The reality is that in lots of places in the world, kids are not using new technology. In lots of places in the world, there are cultures about how technology is introduced into children that suggest that, you know, you may be disadvantaged because there are other places, if that's your fear, that this is not happening. But I think it's a hard one to argue, right, is to say, is, you know, technology pernicious and bad for children? Well, it's an argument that's been rehearsed for nearly 200 years, and I think all of you are living proof in the room that rock and roll didn't rot your brains. I'm John Donvan, and you're listening to Intelligence Squared U.S. Stay with us. I want to remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator, and we have four debaters, two teams of two, arguing it out over this motion, smart technology is making us dumb. Hi, my name's Stacey. Uh, I wanted to address how parents use apps and smart devices to help make their children smarter. Um, I know that my sister and my mom often will look to apps to fill in gaps that they have in their knowledge. Is that making us smarter or not? I think there's no question that if you need to get an answer to a well-defined question, that there's nothing so good as Google or or tweeting it out there or whatever. Um, And again, that's one of the good things uh, uh, about the technology. But deep intelligence isn't about getting precise answers to well-defined questions. It's being able to know what, what are the big questions you should ask? How do you fit this information uh, together to form conceptual knowledge, to get big picture knowledge? And if you spend all your time Googling and grabbing information, you might think you're smart. In fact, there was a very interesting study that came out just a couple of months ago that, that showed that people tend to think they're smarter because they're Googling all the time and they confuse what's on Google with what's in their own brains. Uh, and as one of the researchers said, we have this weird... Uh, We're in this weird time where we seem to be getting dumber, but we are thinking that we're smarter. So listen, I mean, Nick, I think it's interesting, right? You'll concede to the notion that a well-formed question is an appropriate way to engage with a piece of technology. I'd sort of suggest that being able to form a well-formed question is an act of intelligence, right? Being able to work out what the information is you want to extract and find the app that does it suggests a level of engagement with the world that's not about dumbness. If you're a new mum trying to work out, is this not sleeping thing a good thing or a bad thing, and when do I worry? Those are questions that technology may be able to save you quicker than calling your own parent because she's in a different country. Is that about making you more dumb? I don't think so. So there's something for me, again, about how we are framing the notion of dumbness and its opposition that I keep coming back to, right? David, hold off one second. I want to let a response come from the other side. Nick, Let's look at the question of how how well-formed our questions are. There's an interesting... Uh, interview just recently with the top search engineer at Google. And the interviewer said, so I assume that 
as the as Google search engine has gotten smarter, people's questions have also gotten smarter. And he said, he laughed and said, no, it's exactly the opposite. People get lazier and lazier. And, and this shows how we become dependent on the, the technology to do our thinking for us. And as a result, we get lazy. Uh, we, we fall victim to what scientists call automation complacency. You just simply think, let the machine do it for us. So even the formation of questions, we seem to be getting worse and worse as the search and it gets better and better. David Weinberger. So, as I understand it, Nick, what's actually going on with the searches is that they've gotten much longer. Uh, people actually type in what is, you know, a whole question with a question mark at the end, um, because that now works, whereas before, the well for forming a question well at Google meant figuring out what were the terms that Google wanted that would give you back the right results. It wasn't about good question forming, it was about knowing how Google worked. Uh, but I think that your comment about people Google and they think they're smart is that you're actually, I think, repeating Socrates' mistake, which is, you know, really good company to be in. But in the Phaedrus, he, and I'm sure you know this, that in the Phaedrus, uh, Socrates made it's a terrible mistake, doesn't make a lot. Um, he's wondering about the smart tech of his time, which was writing things down, it was literacy. And he said, this is, this will, this is terrible because our, our memory will fail, we will get much worse at, at remembering things. And he was absolutely right about that, uh, because if anybody here would like to stand up and recite the Iliad by heart, please do so and show me wrong. But generally, our memory has, has gotten much smaller than it, uh, than, it, than it was. So he was right about that, but he was wrong about the effect of literacy. The effect of literacy has, in fact, made our memory a thousand times better. We, know so, we remember but, so much more as a species. And but that, but that wasn't Nick's point. I, I think, just to speak... Uh, you, no, you, you're, you're the one who brought up Socrates, right? And uh, so I can bring him up too. Um, <laughs> so what was Socrates' greatest contribution? Nick was just saying that one of the problems with Google or our, our search-centric culture is people are increasingly lazy. And what they're really lazy about is asking questions. What we're having is the automation of the act of asking a question. And that is one of the consequences or casualties of, of, of this digital revolution. And of course, Socrates' greatest, one of his greatest contributions to our culture was in the art of asking the question. That's what knowledge was, asking questions. And as Nick has made it clear, we have forgotten or we are forgetting how to ask questions. So that's extremely troubling. David Weinberger. So the other fear that Socrates had in that dialogue about writing um, was that written stuff is never as good as, as in person, face to face, because the written thing will not respond to you. You can't ask it a question. And the internet is not a series of answers. It's a series of conversations of various forms. And now we are able to engage in conversations about any topic, whether it's, uh, it's about epistemological chaos or it's about whether a Mini Cooper is any good in the winter in Boston. And we can talk with other people and we can get answers. This is a, a far more interactive and responsive medium than we've had before except in in-person conversation. I think we're going to have time for one more question. I'm just curious myself, as this debate has proceeded before you, has, has anybody been multitasking in any form? <laughs> yeah, some hands have gone up. You, you missed an amazing debate. <laughs> well, it's right there. Hi, uh, my name is Davina. I have a question about Cuba. I was there uh, a little over a year ago. And I, I, was, I just want to warn you, this has to really zoom in very quickly. Right. The on question is that, that <laughs> Cubans for the last over 50 years have not had access to almost any technology. And they've been living in a way where they are, the fiber optic cables are built around Cuba. They're not, um, they're not, ha and when I was there, we were in a lot of bars and there was dancing. Okay, I, but there wasn't I, wise, I, there wasn't this wise thought. And I'm wondering what... Are you disappointed with humans, or do you think that in the absence of technology, people are just sitting around and like thinking about what's the meaning of life, or you know, they want technology? Okay, that is a great question. Let's take it to Nick Carr. There's, I'm not, I'm certainly not arguing against technology. Uh, Technology is books. Technology are, uh, are the good things we can do with computers, the way computers can help us uh, do things. Uh, what I'm arguing about is how we think today, thanks to our dependency on our smartphones and our computers and our uh, dependency on social media. You can certainly understand why people who are cut out from the technology would want in. Uh, 
But that doesn't change the fact of how we actually use the technology and how we behave with it and how it influences our thinking. And the, the studies and the research and the science points to the fact that we are, in fact, turning into scatterbrains. I guess the question is, and I would hate to use Cuba as a kind of, you know, example, as a kind of laboratory experiment, but if you were, what is the kind of the vision you then have about what the right use of it is? What's the right use of technology if the one we have now isn't it? Well, I'd be worried about putting it into the hands of, Gu of Cuba's government or any government determining how we use technology or how we use information. So I would push that to the side. I would say that what we, everything we know about it is that we should use it less. And, and that concludes, what should we use it for? That concludes what? round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where our motion is smart technology is making us dumb. So now we move on to round three. Round three are closing statements by each debater in turn. First, here summarizing his position in support of the motion, smart technology is making us dumb. Here is Andrew Keene, author of The Internet is Not the Answer. Well, you can't have a debate like this without, again, ending with Socrates and Plato, since we're supposed to be talking about dumbness and intelligence. You remember, or most of you should remember, in Plato's Republic, Socrates' definition of intelligence was bound up in his notion of the cave and of being able to distinguish illusion from truth. And his argument in the Republic was that we were mostly looking at shadows in his cave. And, uh, going from Socrates and Plato back to David, um, let me quote him. <laughs> he said, the internet is giving us the idea of freedom. And I agree with him. It is giving us the idea of freedom. And he says, that's empowering. But look at our world. We're not empowered. It is, of course, the classic manifestation, perhaps in digital terms, of Plato or Socrates' cave, where we think we're empowered. We think by making statements about politics or economics or supposedly bringing down some powerful figure, we think we're free. We think we're empowered. We're living in the world where the idea of freedom has essentially been digitalized and commodified and sold to us, or perhaps not sold because it's a supposedly free economy. But the truth is, in this world, we are more and more, I don't know about the word dumb, we are less and less aware of our reality. We think we're empowered, we think we're free, Andrew but actually Keen, I'm we're sorry. living in the cave. Your time is up. Thank you very much, Andrew Keane. The motion, smart technology is making us dumb, and here to summarize his position against this motion, David Weinberger, senior researcher at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Uh, thank you. This has been really, has been great. Um, but I, I listen to your arguments, and I come back to the fact that even if you're right about everything you said, I think it's undeniable that this is the greatest time in human history to be wanting to know. There is no better time. The access to information has never been this free. Everybody, you don't have to be at a major university to get access to, uh, to a wide range. The ability to um, engage, not just read, the ability to participate in the creation of knowledge, whether this is by asking questions, dumb questions, smart questions, by, by posing wrong ideas and bad ideas and, and finding how the world reacts, by participating in a more genuine way and learning from people, by lurking on lists and seeing what people are saying, where lurking means watching but not talking, it's not the bad lurking. We've never had to take a course at, at a major university for free to read open access journals where m most of the best physics in the world, the best math in the world is being done. To think that this is not the greatest age to, be, to want to know things strikes me as crazy, as crazy. No matter what, what facts you point at and brain chemistry, et cetera, all, I, none of which I deny. Nevertheless, if the question is, is smart technology making us dumb, I think just looking at what is there should tell us, no, this is the smartest age we've ever had. Thank you, David Weinberger. And the motion is smart technology is making us dumb. 
And here to summarize his position in support of the motion, Nick Carr, author of The Glass Cage, Automation, and Us. We've been speaking mainly about communications and in, in information. And I think that's a very important part of, about smart technology, but it's not everything. Uh, what we're seeing now is we're relying on software, uh, relying on algorithms to do more and more things. Um, not just to gather information, but if you're a pilot, you use them to fly. If you're a doctor, you use them for diagnosis. If you're just an uh, average person, you turn on Google Maps to get around. And we want to believe that this, by handing over uh, tasks to our computers will be raised up. We'll, our own talents will get sharper and better. But even here, the research points to something very different happening. Uh, there was a fascinating study done in the Netherlands, a series of experiments uh, where people were given increasingly smart software to do difficult tasks. And what the researchers found is that as the software got smarter, the people got dumber. Uh, they got lazier, they began to become reliant on the software itself. And we can see this as well in all of the, the, those examples I talked about. David mentioned, well, aren't pilots, uh, shouldn't pilots have the smartest technology possible? Actually, if you look at research and if you look at the recent proclamations from the FAA, they're saying that over automation is actually making pilots less capable and we have to remove some of the dependency on computers. I talked about how the Google person uh, saw this with search as well. Another Google top engineer put the, put the problem very bluntly in an article. He wrote, sharp tools, dull minds. Nick Carr, I'm sorry your time is up. Thank you very much. Our motion is smart technology is making us dumb, and here to summarize her position against this motion, Genevieve Belve, Vice President of Corporate Strategy at Intel. So the proposition, smart technology is making us dumb, it's clearly one that seduces many of you in this room. I watch you applaud, I watch you nod, and I know that there's an echo in it. There's something in it that always appeals. We said the same thing about many technologies over the last 200 years, and I want to make us think for just a moment here about what is that seduction? Because at the beginning of this debate, most of you raised your hands that you had smart technology in your lives. Those of you who don't own it know people who do and live in worlds that are augmented by it. When you were asked if anyone in the room was willing to admit to feeling dumber about it, there were only two of you who actually raised your hands. That makes me suspect there's a number of you in the room who feel it, it's why you applaud, but you wouldn't say you did feel dumber because of it. My suspicion is that threading through all of that is a very human set of preoccupations and anxieties. An anxiety about what technology means for us, what it means for our humanity, our bodies, our competency, what it means to have new technologies in some ways threaten some of those things. But the reality is also, despite Nick's in some ways admirable notion that we should just use it less, that there is more and more technology in our lives, technology that we rely on, technology that some of us love, technology that many of us find valuable and useful and instructive, that helps shape our exercise, our financial futures that we use for banking and travel and leisure activities. And there's something in all of this about why it is that despite all of that, we like to imagine we are more dumb. I find it hard to imagine sitting in a room full of New Yorkers that you secretly in your heart of hearts believe you are dumb. <laughs> Likewise to a radio listening audience who will feel the same thing. So it strikes me that it's very hard to imagine that smart technology is really making all of us dumb. Thank you, Genevieve Bell. And that concludes our closing statements. I have the final results now. It's all in. Let's remind you that the motion is smart technology is making us dumb. Uh, and again, it's the difference between the two votes before and after that determine our winner. Let's look at the first vote. Smart technology is making us dumb. 37% agreed. 33% were against. And 30% were undecided. Kind of a three-way split. Let's take a look at the second vote. Again, we're looking for the difference. The second vote, the team arguing for the motion, their second vote was 47%. From 37 to 47%, they picked up 10 percentage points. That is the number to beat. Let's see the team against the motion. Their first vote was 33%. Their second was 43%. They also pulled in 10%. <laughs> 
it is, it is an intelligence squared first. It is a tie. Congratulations to both teams, all four of our debaters. Thank you from me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared U.S. We'll see you next time. This Intelligence Squared U.S. debate was held in front of a live audience at the Kaufman Center in New York City. Dana Wolf is our executive producer. Robert Rosencrantz is chairman. Taylor Quimby and Rob Christensen are the radio producers. Damon Whittemore is the engineer. Clea Chang is director of production. Chris Kamakawa is our researcher. And I'm your host, John Donvan. For more information or to purchase tickets to future events, visit iq2us.org. To hear the full unedited version or to sign up for the Intelligence Squared podcast, visit npr.org forward slash Intelligence Squared. These debates are made possible by generous contributions from listeners like you and with visionary support from the Connor Davis Family Foundation, David A. Coulter, Christopher W. Johnson Charitable Trust, George L. Orstrom Jr. Foundation, Dr. Kelly Posner Gerstenhaber, Profit Capital Asset Management, the Rosencrantz Foundation, the Arthur N. Roop Foundation, the Mortimer D. Sackler Foundation, and the Paul E. Singer Foundation. From Intelligence Squared U.S., thank you.